feel like I've gotten a tremendous amount of, of insight and perspective from the people that are leading these pods. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Andy, I'm going to switch gears. I'm actually going to go through the list um, so I don't lose track of anybody on is on here. So after Benjamin is Donald Officer. Oh, right. Donald, why don't you just uh, actually introduce yourself? Tell us how you found out about this learning series okay. and also what you would like to ultimately accomplish after the next several months, uh, potentially of us all staying together um, in this particular course or learning process. Well, thank you, uh, Natalie. I appreciate that. Um, I found out about this through a, a, a group that meets in Toronto called the Systems Thinking Ontario Group. And they, they thought I might be interested in your group. I'm certainly interested in innovation. Uh, perhaps not from the angle most of your people are. I don't know that. <laughs> uh, I'm basically a social science writer. And uh, I found there's, there's a, a lot of work out there and a lot of volunteer work too, which is also important. And uh, I'm also a senior, uh, to refer back to Benjamin's points. And I would be very interested in, in connecting with him on his project because I, I actually ran a project uh, through the New Horizons, I guess, three or four years ago. Um, in which we, uh, we, we got cross mentoring going between um, seniors and millennials. And we found that it was, um, it was uh, really uh, very productive, but it was awfully labor intensive because they spoke different languages in many ways. And even though they used the same words, they meant different things. Um, if I can simplify it, which is what I am doing. But once they got past that period, it was very productive. And, uh, you know, uh, we couldn't even show that properly because of the parameters of the uh, of the project. But but it was judged a success, and we were happy to do it. A lot more of that needs to be done. There's a lot of, of seniors out there who uh, are aching to contribute, but uh, don't seem to be able to find the uh, the right avenues. And uh, I'm see the, the silver lining, lining of the cloud, you know, we're, in, we're all under now, the, uh, the virus, of course, because it's forcing us to find different ways to connect and, and find, uh, uh, I guess, social cohesion. So that's basically where I stand right now. And uh, I'd be very interested to hear about a lot of the new technologies, some of which I only read about in Fast Company and Wired. Fantastic. Donald, can I just ask you about the group that told you about this? Because I would like to connect with them. What oh, were absolutely. Doing? Absolutely. Um, well, it's, it's, it's an interesting... Uh, can you, can you just tell me the name and we just have to move on? Yeah, to sure. It's System Thinking Ontario. And the person to contact is David Ng, who is um, retired from IBM, where he worked for years. He is the past international president. And so are some of the other members. Um, like Alana Leonard, who was married to uh, Stafford Beer, and uh, Peter Jones, who uh, teaches um, strategic foresight at um, uh, OCADU. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's actually underexposed, but there's some really interesting thinkers there. Beautiful. Love it. Thank you so much for sharing, Donald. We will come back to you. I just want to make sure that we get through. Absolutely. Um, I, don't, I don't want to overdo the introductions because I no, want no. to get to the meat of it. Um, let's do this fairly pithy, everybody. Um, I want to get through some of the, if you will, didactic or some of the slides, but I really want to get into some discussion as well. So thank you for that, Donald. You're welcome. Uh, moving on to Tara Joe, just a quick introduction, how you heard about this and really kind of what your sort of aspiration of um, some of the work we might be able to do together. Uh, yes, Natalie, my name is Tara Jo. I'm a volunteer with uh, Transformative Technologies. I found out about uh, TT through my sister, Nicole Bradford. And okay. over the years, I've become very, very curious. And um, my contribution is open mind willingness and a desire to learn and to give back to this community. Beautiful, love it. Thank you, Tara, for joining us today. We are now gonna to move to Andy Swindler. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Andy, I'm based in Chicago in the United States. Um, 
pretty sure I must have gotten an email about this or something. We were, uh, I have a startup called Feel Real, which you can find at feelreal.net. And we were part of the cohort, the last uh, TransTech cohort. And then we were also a sponsor for the um, conference a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Time is fuzzy these days. Mm -hmm. uh, or was that last week? Oh, goodness. Anyway, um, yeah, so very briefly about Feel Real, uh, you know, it's, it's a community, uh, it's a marketplace, it's a movement. Uh, it, it is all focused around exactly what we're doing here. These idea, this, the idea of intimate online gathering spaces, um, sort of similarly to the way, Natalie, you, you know, offered that you all have been working in this well before COVID. So we were fairly quietly doing the same in the idea of building our marketplace and our community. And in the last six weeks have just exploded uh, in a really fun way. And um, we use the term space holders generally to describe the, the type of convening that this is and the type of convener. And so that's very much our main focus right now is, is gathering. We've got about 140 space holders in our community. And one metaphor we're really fond of is the idea of creating kind of a trade union for space holders. And so I'll just pause there for now. Nice, lovely, love the work and can't wait to explore that further and in, uh, in, uh, in the work that you're doing. So Dr. Shrinshuri, why don't you introduce yourself, how you found out about it, and what you're looking to aspire to learn in this learning series. Um, I think you're muted. There's yeah. a little button, here can we go. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can, yes. Sorry about that, I was a little muted there. So I, I came to TransTech after I participated in an online training with Paola and some of the, the executive leaders of TransTech. And I was invited to be a thought leader and participate in the learning pod here. And so I'm also going to be hosting a learning pod on the 21st of this month for exemplary leadership around the space of in a human enhancement and how we, and the reason why I'm attending this particular session is because I am a systems thinker and we have a solution that we've implemented that addresses the systemic issues within the state of California where I am. I'm being a chapter leader here in Sacramento and Stockton region, which are two separate counties within, within California, but I'm interested in the systemic innovation in propelling it forward from a human enhancement perspective and how we tap into uh, capabilities that are there within us that are dormant that we don't realize we have access to. And making it possible for every human being to accomplish their vision and their dreams from using trans tech. So, we have a number of programs and services that we provide and I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. And that's really my, my goal is to contribute to human evolution through uh, research and development and bringing forth new solutions to solve systemic issues within our global economies. Beautiful, love it and love what you're bringing to the world. We are moving to William Sue. So why don't you introduce how you found out about it and what you're looking to aspire for. I'm in a um, startup community in Raleigh, Durham, um, North Carolina, US. I don't know exactly how I afforded this information, but probably one of those uh, um, IoT, um, the community, innovation community possibly. Mm -hmm. I'm generally interested in innovation and uh, are designing a lot of new designs in terms of, uh, like you said, some can we do something totally different in, instead of uh, you know incremental improvement versus totally new. So, I mean, Perfect. Well, glad to have you, William, and actually glad to have this small, intimate group. Uh, I'm glad that it actually is a small group because I think that it allows us to see each other, first of all, to speak to each other and to actually have a little bit of a collaborative discussion. So um, I'm actually going to go over a couple of slides that I've actually put together as I'm starting to explore this topic. Um, this is something that's really of interest to me personally. And uh, what we're going to do is end this discussion with a series of questions. We'll see how far we can get into this. 
I'm also going to ask everybody to please join the Facebook group. I'm going to be <coughs> posting questions in there uh, between each of the actual synchronous virtual live sessions. And so invite you to answer those questions, dialogue with other colleagues, you know, back and forth, just so we can learn from each other as we're working on our own projects or pontificating in the future about how we can sort of solve the world's problems together, starting with systems and innovation. So first of all, can everybody see my slides? You can give yes. me a thumbs up, everybody cool, great. So here's the thing, um, you I would have to lit literally be living in a, under a bush if you didn't realize that we're living in unprecedented change today. I mean, you know, I, my father is actually 86, my mother is 79, and even as long as they have lived, they have never seen anything like this before. So we're living truly in a time where we don't have, bio, we don't have markers, we don't have ways to, you know, we're, we're going back to the Spanish flu and World War II and what was it like in the depression and all these other things. But truly and sincerely, we've never experienced this. And this is our current now. So it's both exhilarating and scary. It's both enticing and tantalizing, yet completely ambiguous. And as we all know, when we, we are human beings living in heuristics, that we live in, on um, automaticity, it actually requires less brain control and less energy. When we can go and do things that are feeling more automatic, suddenly we're put into an ambiguous place and that makes us feel makes us feel disconcerted. It makes us feel at it doesn't make us feel at ease. But I see this as an opportunity. So um, what this also means is that we um, our problem solving capabilities are literally at an all time high. Um, we I actually just participated recently in an MIT COVID nineteen hackathon. <coughs> Now that I've actually done it, serendipitously, I'm seeing hackathons everywhere. Hackathons for this, hackathons for that. I'm mm -hmm. doing them with my clients with pharma hackathons. Mm -hmm. Everybody is mashing and melding ideas and generating all kinds of uh, innovations in, in an unprecedented way. So not only is there this unprecedented change, but there's also equally an unprecedented level of collaboration. And so when the two come together, we are literally engineering serendipity. So what I also want to say here is that society as a result of this new forum and this new reality, we're requiring um, the, cha this, the challenges is that we are looking for new dynamic capabilities. And um, the other thing as well too is um, the fact is that we, we're, we're really challenged with this. I mean, one of the things I think is really interesting is my business partner and I started our company 11 years ago. We've been talking about online collaboration, asynchronous discussions, virtual clinical trials, non, you know, all sorts of other things that we do for 11 years. And it's only unfortunately since we've hit COVID-19 that we have all these people scurrying to the door yeah. or being pushed or their hand is being forced in doing this. You've probably heard this as well with telemedicine, one of the fastest growing areas of all areas in medicine right now. But the fact of the matter is this technology has been around forever. So it's a dynamic milieu of changing thoughts, paradigms, cultural mems. And it, it like I said, it, it brings both challenge and also opportunity. I think the other thing that would be really worth exploring as a, as a group here in our weeks and months to come as a discussion group is we need a new toolbox of strategies and processes. And one of the biggest obstacles that we're starting to see the dismantling of today are the bureaucracies, are the various kinds of regulatory and legal frameworks that we're working in. The FDA, other, other sort of, you know, the, um, you know, Health Canada, uh, what's going on in Europe, the different regulatory approval bodies, they're kind of coming up with new ways and systems to, ex to accelerate approvals um, reviews, et cetera. So this is the start of this dismantling. We need to be doing more of it. So what we're really saying here is that innovation requires an emergent and an evolutionary approach. You probably have seen this a lot of your companies that are running agile companies or uh, mechanisms is it's, a, it's an iterative process. 
you're creating, learning, pivoting, learning, creating, you know, reviewing, pivoting. It's just this constant evolution and an iteration, almost like a sine wave. Mm. So at the end of the day, I thought it would be remiss not to get into some sort of a definition of what, what systems innovation is in a formalized way. And really the way I see this is systems innovation, which is really a derivative of sy systems thinking, can be understood as a combination of complex systems and thinking in the process of innovation so as to enable transformative change within a complex system. So there's a lot of really key words. We could probably spend an entire session dissecting this, but some of the key words here are the words complex, the words innovation, and the words systems um, that comes up. And so at the end of the day, when the way I want to frame innovation is in this, is in this mode. First of all, it's different from creativity. And that is a whole other discussion about how do you get into a creative mode? How do you create as an organization, especially if you're doing this virtually, because we're so used to thinking that creativity is an offshoot of these things that are in person where there's a touch feel, where you're reading people's body language. Um, there's an opportunity for really hitting and banging and you know getting into people's heads. How do we do this now in a new virtual way? But what I want to suggest is that creativity and, and all the different mechanisms and means in, in achieving it, um, we talk about flow states, et cetera, is that it's something that's truly innovative and new, but it's only when you add it to the approval system. If this creative thing that has been developed has truly been adopted by somewhat of the, the population, can we really call it an innovative solution? And so that's the framework of which I want to discuss innovation. It's creativity in combination with you know a regulatory or basically a population mechanism of uptake and approval and um, and integration so um, i know a lot of us have already surfaced some of this and that is there is tons of things that we're making out there everywhere you look i get emails on the latest new tech innovations and this new app what i think is really interesting though is i think there's like 150,000 different apps and growing um, in the healthcare space. But the problem is, is only 3% of them are actually either downloaded or used. So the thing is, there's no shortage of mm. creativity. The problem is, is how much of those would really be deemed as innovative? How many of those have truly been adopted by patients, physicians, caregivers, other um, healthcare stakeholders? So that's really a question that we need to be asking ourselves in the world of things. So a couple of other things for us to consider as part of our discussion today is we need to go above incremental innovation. And I thought this was a really cool picture. I'm a big, I'm a big car person, so I had to include this. So is how do we think beyond even the self-driving vehicle? How do we look at how do we look at traffic systems and how do we solve for that in a bigger way? On the same vein, as we think about the new smart house or, um, you know, like how we actually make sure that it's more energy efficient and the latest new windows and these new cool furnishings that we're putting in. How do we put that into a bigger picture? How do we think about smart cities? How do they function collectively and as a group? Um, on that same note is how do we get from the idea of power plants to smart grids? How do we think about energy in a much higher, bigger, more comprehensive, holistic way? How do we look beyond electric grids and start thinking about grids of information? The internet is part of the grid. And in the future, just like we tap into electrical grids, how are we as innovative companies going to be able to tap into artificial intelligent grids? Maybe one day AI will be just like an electrical grid where we'll plug it in and use it for our own purposes. And for all of us in the healthcare space, how do we think beyond, and this is very prevalent as part of the discussions I have with my clients, getting beyond the drug conversation, going beyond the pill to talking about healthcare. What does this look like as a system? What are we doing beyond this, beyond the pill, looking at digital therapeutics, uh, bioprint, 3D bioprinting, robotics, nanotechnologies, all the things that your companies and others are working on. 
Um, I love Elon Musk. Not so much that he's a great orator because he's not. He probably needs an avatar to represent him, I think, a little bit better than he does himself. But he is, of course, a systems thinker. And one of the things that I think he does, he does great service for himself is not only is he a fatalist, so he comes to things as saying, 90% of the chance I'm going to fail at this. So anything that is built on top of that is icing on the cake. But more importantly, he's a bit of a, what I call a, um, a, uh, a, a materialist, or um, he's basically goes down to reductionist thinking. He takes ideas down to their main building blocks and he goes to first principles. So in other words, taking them down to the Lego blocks. So for example, somebody asked him recently, you know, what made you think that you could come up with a better battery? So just like Henry Ford or Steve Jobs, if you'd ask the public at that time through a typical market research study, what would you like to have? What would be the next big innovation? In the time of Henry Ford, people would have said, a bigger buggy, a faster horse. And in Steve Jobs' time, it would have been, you know, a smarter, uh, you know, typewriter. So people in the Johari window of what we don't know, what we don't know, is sometimes you can't ask people about what they're looking for. Sometimes we need to take what we already know, dismantle it and reduce it into its most basic principles and rethink it. And that is really the whole idea about reorganizing from, from base principles. So when we start thinking about the political, regulatory, and legal systems at which we find ourselves mired in, how do we break those down into their most basic building blocks to create something new? And ultimately, one of the things I think all of us can think about is being innovators in the garden of opportunity is these are considered more oftentimes than not the weeds that choke out the gestational period or the opportunities for incubation of new uh, opportunities. So how do we dismantle these weeds so that new things can grow in the garden? So as I was mentioning, it's taking things down to their basic principles and rebuilding them so that we can create patterns and connections. At the end of the day, this is something that Elon Musk also talks about a lot of the times. It's not the building blocks. It's at the end of the day, when we talk about quantum computing, when we talk about nanotechnology, when we talk about the basic diodes of the silicon chips and things, the building blocks are the same. It's how we can join them, how we join them, how we actually see patterns. And one of the things I think is really interesting that I heard about this recently is people who have a lot more dopamine circulating in their systems have an ability to see more connections in the universe than people who don't. So, Again, dopamine gets released in a lot of different ways, um, keeping in mind that it's one of the strongest neurotransmitters in our bodies that allows us to feel motivation. So it becomes a self-fulfilling legacy that the more motivation we feel and the more inspired we are by the things that we're doing and seeing and thinking and feeling with others around us, the more patterns we see, the more we, opportunity we see. Um, this is why <coughs> people like Elon Musk and the Jeff Bezos and, you know, the other people that have done extravagant, you know, Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil keep seeing more and more and more opportunity when the rest of the world probably can't see what they see. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy and it builds on each other. So what will it take to build a new economy? And so when I start thinking about things like blockchain and thinking about things like distributed autonomous organizations, how scary is that? How is that going to disrupt the things that we're creating and doing? But where can we leverage that? How are we going to be able to use these distributed organizations? Not necessarily talk about displacing people, because that actually started those conversations from the time of Gutenberg, when we're actually creating new printing presses, or the or or the um, uh, the uh, when we were replacing those things. Those are when the words ludite came in, where people were crashing and destroying those initial printing presses because they were worried about losing their jobs. Nobody ever thought during that time period that yoga instructors and writers and um, you know, programmers were ever gonna be a job of the future. So we don't know what this looks like. We don't know what the jobs of the future are with in the realm of DAOs and other sorts of things. We automatically just assume that UBI or universal basic income will be the, the solution 
but there's probably going to be all kinds of offshoots that we can't see today. At the end of the day, we're talking about inflection points. Everything that we're doing, all of these opportunities, things that we're creating are the 1% incremental innovations that are going to take us to the next level. And you probably, for other people who might have actually read Peter Diamandis' book on bold abundance, his latest one called The Future is, is Happening Faster Than We Think, we talk about the six stages of digitization, deception, where it's actually this low gestation period where a new idea, a new product, a new organization, it hasn't been built up yet. It's the creative creativity before it's become an innovation because it hasn't been wholeheartedly incorporated um, and uh, adopted. So that's the deceptive phase. Then when it becomes adopted and in mainstream, it becomes disruptive, dematerialized, demonetized, and then eventually democratized. So these are the different stages. And so what's really scary for a lot of people is when something becomes de dematerialized, what does that mean for the thing you've created? Or more importantly, what does this new economy look like when we no longer can charge for all the free stuff in the economy and on the web? You know, knowledge is free now. I was just watching a program the other day with MOOCs and how undergraduate education is probably gonna eventually become free. How do we make money in this new economy? So here's, an, here's the thing, there's always opportunity. There's always the silver lining. We need to be the dopamine drip people who can see the connections, can see, see the, the parts, see the opportunity as we continue to revolutionize what we're doing, destroy it, you know, create an opportunity and then create the next thing. And so as social entrepreneurs, we have to be content and not just giving a fish or teaching how to fish, but we will not rest until we have revolutionized the fishing industry. So this was a beautiful quote from Bill Drayton. Mm. So mm. what I'd like us to think about here is we need to think holistically and we need to think globally. So one of the reasons I love the opportunity to speak with people like you is it's not just a local thing. It's not just something I can talk to with other people in the Toronto chapter. This is actually something that we can brainstorm and discuss as a global team. So I actually want to start off with, I have four <coughs> questions, but we'll see how we're doing with timing. And before I move to this question, I was wondering if there was anything that I said that was thought provoking, um, that applies to you, that doesn't apply to you, that you thought was jarring, that you disagree with. Um, want to open it up for any general comments on anything <coughs> that I've just shared. <clears throat> well, I like the, um, it's interesting when you talk about the number of healthcare apps and the lack of apps that are, I mean, I find that all the time, whether in the work that I'm doing or the people that I'm talking to or with my own family, um, you know, my mom's a senior um, looking for stuff. I mean, there's so much stuff out there. You don't know how it's going to work. And it's almost like there's too much noise. And recently, that's something that they talk about over at um, Singularity. Um, where they're talking about, um, it's not that there's too much noise, it's just that we're not filtering it better. So that really resonates, like figuring out how we filter this information better so that people can have access to what's relevant and valuable, um, you know, in the applications that exist. I love that, Benjamin. I love the idea of filtration and curation, and that potentially could be a brand new industry in the world that we live in. So very good point. Any other comments? Uh, I could make a couple. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, some of the things that have been, you know, rightly labeled as, uh, as obstacles or uh, bottlenecks, whatever you want to call them, uh, are in fact essential, but they need to be totally reformed and repurposed because of the way they've been organized. Like bureaucracy, for example. If we get rid of all of the regulations, we introduce chaos and destruction on a scale you couldn't imagine. We have, the right, have to have the right regulations properly updated and properly informed by people who know what they're doing and know what's going on. That's just one. But, you know, um, tearing down a lot of the things uh, and major disruption, while I believe is absolutely essential because we can't afford to go the way we used to, but you have to scaffold it 
so you don't destroy people's lives in the process. In other words, find ways to keep people going uh, in the changeover period, much as we're at so far trying to do with the virus, right? Pumping all this money into the uh, economy, who knows what the impact will be, but at least people will be able to eat. And um, <coughs> these are things we've never given much care, much um, attention to because we're much more interested in innovating and seeing shiny new uh, technologies come along without considering the implications for the society. Like the printing press, for example, ushered in a hundred years of religious war, totally useless, wasted lives and destroyed the economies and, and, and even cities. We don't want to do that. You know, these are, these are real risks because of the way people think and the, the fact that there's always a lag between what is physically there and how people can process it. Really good points. I do totally agree with you is there has to be that, we have to strike that balance. And uh, I think with all things, sometimes we have to go to extremes. It's like a pendulum. And then when we find the middle way, I call that the way of the Tao. Um, mm. that, w that way of the Tao is only a temporary space between the undulations of the pendulum. So uh, I think just part of human living and human motion that we have to go through those swings. And we, we need those swings because without the contrast, we don't know when we're on the right side of that pendulum swing. Mm -hmm. anybody, anybody else have any thoughts, Andy? Yeah, just for a couple quick ones. Really nice overview. Uh, the first one is just, I'm constantly thinking about human motivation, both individually and at scale, as you mentioned, you know, cause it's, especially right now, it's fascinating to look at, as you pointed out, what does it take, right? For, for the world to let, you know, to, to adopt things that have been around for quite some time. And, that, and so that I think about that a lot. I think that that's really a, good, a juicy one. And then also I think it's related to what you're pointing out here. Uh, happy to know I have something in common with Elon other than a love of cars and rockets. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm also like, just, I can't help, but always try to trace things to their root. Cause otherwise I feel like we're just putting band-aids on bullet holes and it's, um, you know, for me, the, the, the way I look at that in the context of what I'm building is the tendency for humans to avoid emotions. And so that's a lot of what we're focused on is, and I think it's very much related to your question. Yeah. So do you, so does anybody else have any comments about the slides before anything I've shared or anything we've discussed as a group yet before we move on to some of the discussion questions? Yeah, this is Dr. Shinshuri. I, I just have one question is uh, in, in looking at your question, I'm curious as to uh, why you, re you have uh, focused primarily on the mental health and neurotech aspect of the innovation or are you, are you gonna be more expansive in other areas that actually touch point on that healthcare ecosystem? You know what, that's a really great point. And I think it was really, this was actually done before coming to this group to see who was gonna be participating. I'm in agreement. I think um, if everybody else is good, I think to expand it for the entire healthcare ecosystem. So it's more inclusive. Mm -hmm. The reason I originally put this is because that's sort of the mandate of the transformative technologies group, that it's, it's usually more focused on the mental health fitness flourishing, but you know, quite frankly, I agree. I think it should be a bit more um, inclusive. So thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Anybody else before we, I wanna go around uh, asking people this question, but anything else about anything I've shared already around innovate, sort of the overview of systems innovation and some of that opening, if you will, of the things that we'll be talking about in the months ahead. Just briefly want to mention, I need to leave at five until the hour to get a little break. So. Yeah, absolutely. We may not have a ton of time to go through all of these. I do want to hit something right away before we hit some of these questions. And that is, um, is everybody amenable to the idea of maybe having these live sessions maybe once a month for an hour and then at, you know responding to any questions through Facebook? Uh, I was originally going to do this every two weeks, but wasn't sure if that would be way too high a frequency or cadence. Does Anybody have any feedback on frequency? Or is I, once a month too often? I, I would say twice a month would be a little, because I'm interested in the topic. 
And since I also have my own topic to do in the month, it'll be difficult for me to try to make them if, if, if it conflicts with something that I have going as well. That would okay. be my only concern. Yeah, I'm, one month feels right to me right now. I don't think I knew what I was getting into and I appreciate the invitation to be in more of a cohort. That's, that's, that's fun, so, but once a month seems like right, the right cadence for me. All right, anybody else? Is everybody in agreement? Um, yeah. yeah. That works for me too, once a month. Once a month, beautiful. So I know some of you do have to get to go and that's fine, Andy, or for anybody else who needs to leave, uh, we will send a follow-up and uh, there will always be a video recording for this as well, which you'll also be able to find in the Facebook page when we're done too. But let's actually just see if we can just hit up as many questions as we can is building blocks. Um, what are some of them um, building block innovations that make up our current healthcare system? What are some of the things that we're seeing as, as key elements, seeds, of innovation right now that are just trickling in. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I do. Uh, we're here in California. Our governor, I don't know if anyone else is following what's, what California has been doing um, from a, a whole person care perspective, but they are reinvesting in our local communities using cannabis legislation tax dollars. Mm. And <laughs> We, our agency collaboratively is par uh, partnered with a number of other agencies around the state uh, to secure the funding with the governor's office. So we have secured uh, funding at the, at the state level for whole person care, and it's a concierge of services related to healthcare. And it expands beyond just healthcare and includes uh, some vertical markets around economic development and workforce development, as well as education. So we've got these three, what we like to call formularies. And so these are some initial building blocks that I think are really important to the healthcare ecosystem because what it's doing <clears throat> is it's allowing us to look outside the box of where we traditionally focused on healthcare and looking at to other industries and other uh, markets that complement how we improve the health and well being of individuals, not just on a mental level from a neurotech perspective, but also holistically their education and providing the right educational mix that leads to uh, a better health and well-being through economic development, through creating of jobs and things like that. So I do think it would be poignant for this group to look at these alternative ways in which we can, you know, bring innovation to this topic and to the tech world, the trans tech world, Mm. based on what we're doing and some of the things that we're doing. I know we're actually doing it in collecting research and, and actually changing lives, helping individuals change and transform their own life uh, through this whole person care concierge of services that we provide across vertical markets. I was actually wondering on that, Dr. Shinshuri, if you might be able to share more about this whole person care um, methodology in the Facebook group, either some references, links, what have you, so that we can explore it further. That could even potentially be a, a topic of interest. Yeah. Um, if we could do that afterwards, um, that would be terrific. Will do. Anybody else uh, nuggets, innovation nuggets that are starting to seed in um, our health ecosystem? Anybody else want to bring up anything of what you see or what you have been seeing? Um, I could make a small observation having just reviewed a book. I am not a doctor. I am not highly familiar with, well, I am I'm in a backdoor sort of way with the medical care system, but uh, it strikes me that local centers need to be doing more research and need to have more independence in what they do and at the same time be part of larger networks where they all folk bring things together so you get to sharing not just the best practices but of innovative practices. And, uh, you know, it's, it's most of the, uh, the research now is concentrated in large firms uh, who have considerations that may not be of greatest benefit to people in other jurisdictions. Yeah, really, really good points. I think that probably, um, 
that that actually takes us to another question. I'm going to jump to question three because I think it links really nicely and we'll go back to question two. But what you're really talking about, I think in some ways is kind of how we create stuff right now. So for example, from new medications, um, there's a whole clinical trial process where it's coming from manufacturers, patients are kind of brought in, they're sort of, they call it patient centricity, but this is gonna look like a very, very different world in the future, especially now with COVID-19, a lot of the traditional clinical trial methodologies have been stalled or trials are being canceled. Um, and they, ha they have to be looking at things in a different way with real world evidence, using sensors, using Fitbits, using um, Bluetooth generated stethoscopes and other sorts of uh, you know, telemedicine type of uh, monitoring, maybe eventually software like facial software recognition and other things are considered really taboo technologies that are gonna have to be incorporated for the future. Um, but I'd love to get everybody's thoughts on anything around that you have seen around political, regulatory, legal in infrastructure, and maybe even talk a little bit about your particular field. What have you run into and what do you think needs to be changed here to be able to move some of your thinking and some of your innovations forward? Well, it comes up for me, uh, you know, I just heard this uh, sort of secondhand, but it, but it stuck with me as a curiosity, not necessarily a controversial statement, but that perhaps the way we run things right now, it should, should be called sick care instead of health care. We're yeah. so oriented around, you know, fixing people who are sick, often throwing drugs at them, and not not the systemic challenges. But I think part of what part of what isn't doesn't seem to be a huge part of the discussion is the actual quality of health of practitioners. And so we mm -hmm. we we were called to hold some spaces for healthcare workers and frontline workers. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking, well, you know, rightly, everybody's talking about their equipment or people using all this. And what about their emotional state of, of working that hard on the front lines? And one of the things that came out of that discussion with some people in <coughs> hospital systems <coughs> was that, in their opinion, that the doctors and nurses are some of the least healthy populations around. So uh, I'm curious. It's really just an open curiosity for me if that's true, if that could be validated. And if so, it, it's a little bit of like lead by example. Like, like if we're not actually working on the, on the health and the, the holistic health and preventative health of the population who's actually in, in service of everybody else. So very interesting. So you're talking really around the infrastructure, <clears throat> how we, we evaluate our systems in general, or even the, the, uh, the fitness of our healthcare providers is what kinds of metrics are we using in the evaluations? Um, these are really, really great questions about everything from the tiered way that we're looking at providers to the systems that they're working on to the healthcare in general is what is going to be those measurements of success. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts, anything that's impacting the work that you're doing or aspiring to do, um, political, regulatory, or legal um, confines that need to be reviewed? Mm. I mean, I'm in, I talk to clients all the time and there's a ton of things here. And I, one of the things has to do with bioethics and mm -hmm. privacy and data information. We can't make the next level of, of, of um, exponential technologies until we can get our heads around what is shared versus what is owned data, right? So this is that whole conversation that has to go around is what do I own that's my data i.e. blockchain, how do I actually make money on my data? How do I own it? How do I sell it to manufacturers who want to use <clears throat> clinical data as opposed to right now I'm giving the data away? So what's shared versus what's owned? And you know all of the controversy around that, there's a book recently written on, it's called Capital, um, Surveillance Capitalism. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of dialogue happening about how we're surveilling people and what does that look like and social credits in China. So I think that that's a whole legal infrastructure discussion that needs to take place around data. Mm -hmm. If I might intrude, I think it's also an opportunity to look at how our psychology relates to our legal system. I think it's out of sync. And uh, there's some things that do need to be shared and some things that should be kept private. But some things that really doesn't matter provided you have the right mindset among the majority of the population. But if you don't, it'll be twisted. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one of the things that I've been following here is this um, kind of movement about um, selling or monetizing your own data. I mean, I know it's kind of a nascent thing and there's a few companies that are kind of working in it. Um, but uh, I do think that will be an interesting factor and game changer if people have the ability to sell their own data. I think that it will it'll change the way that things get transacted. So that's an area that I'm, I'm interested in and following for sure. Yeah, I am as well too. I think that's like the long distant future, but you never know, things are exponential. But I see that as being the, the underlying port, port to UBI, universal basic income. I think that there will be a lot of roboticized and automatized future that lies ahead for us. So mm -hmm. what is gonna be the role of humans, especially in these um, these uh, disconnected autonomous organizations or, you know, those, those DAOs and things like that is where does the people fit into this? So I think that what this is going to be is you just live your life, do what you need to do. And actually there's sensors all around us in our clothes embedded in our, in our screens. There's things looking at our facial expressions and we make money. Basically that's the way we, we get UBI through selling our data. Um, and just like becoming a YouTuber, where the more people that view your things or the more people who are going to use your data, the more money you make. So if you become an interesting specimen that, you know, you're a triathlete, and more people want to see what your details are, then uh, that's what that's what I see uh, happening eventually. But again, that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to question two is what patterns and connections do we see as being a common denominator um, between all of our systems in the healthcare ecosystem. So what are, what are we seeing as being some of the common denominators? So as we talk about looking at the core building blocks, what are some of the ways we can actually find patterns and connections? Anybody, that's kind of a deep, um, yeah. very holistic question, but, uh, and you can bring it down to maybe even what, what you're working on, what your system, what your business, what your, your interests are in this and how you see that fitting into the greater healthcare ecosystem. Mm. I'm gonna use this opportunity to excuse myself. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, nice having you, Andy, and we'll be seeing you next time. Yeah, thank you so much for holding this space. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. And sadly, I have to <clears throat> jump off. I have another call starting shortly, but thanks so much, everybody, and I'll see you on Facebook and at the next call as well. Fantastic. Have a good day. Good day. Thank you so much, Benjamin. And if we're having difficulty answering that, the last question I had is where do we sit currently in the exponential framework? Um, or where does your company, is it digitized? Is it in the deceptive phase, disruptive, dematerialized, demonetized, or democratized? Mm -hmm. So where, where do you see things either in the greater healthcare ecosystem or what you're currently working on? What phase of it is? Any responses? Well, I, I just say my suspicion is, uh, from what I've seen, and I haven't done anything like a thorough or certainly scientific re review of it, is that in different aspects, we're at every one of these stages. And the problem is, you know, making them fit together and dealing with legacy systems and trying to be innovative at the same time must be bloody hard. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a great point, Donald. I think that it's a great point, depending on what you are, there could be things in every one of these stages all kind of creeping up together. I don't think it's one big simultaneous thing happening. I think there's different things happening at different places. Um, I think some things are just basic, brand new coming into this, like the idea of doing clinical trials in silica, basically in machines as opposed to in people. Um, you know, using quantum computers for being able to evaluate and create new medications. Um, I think that we're also in another place where we're disrupting healthcare by having things like telemedicine. So a lot of these third party mm -hmm. people that are going on like tra traditional clinical research organizations and the middlemen who were doing clinical trials are being disrupted out of the picture. Um, and in terms of dematerialize, I think telemedicine is also a lot of things that we used to go and do like physical properties and hospitals and you know actual machines and units, we're gonna probably be replacing these with digital sensors. 
and other ways of being able to receive real world evidence. So, um, and I think at the end of the day, demonetization, it's possible that we'll potentially have free access to a nursing avatar or an, uh, you know, a physician. And then you, know, you only pay for certain kinds of things. And eventually everybody will become a physician or the computer or Siri or, um, or uh, Alexa will become your physician. So that's the dem democratization of it. So I think everything is kind of flowing in this ecosystem. We're all kind of heading into this interesting place. So um, I think that's gonna kind of tie things up for us today. And I want us to all uh, join the Facebook group if you can. So if you could take note of this, it's called Systems Innovation for Transformative Technology Community. So if you could write that down um, and uh, plug into that, type that into your computer and join our group, that would be awesome. Um, I would love to get your feedback on what you think about this so far. This was really just a trial. It's a pretty heavy topic. There's a lot of cool things in, in this. Uh, I do hope that you continue to want us to, to stay on, share it maybe with other friends who you think would also benefit from this. Mm -hmm. And uh, without further ado, I just wanted to thank all of you for participating today. Yeah, could you put that previous slide back up? I didn't get right get the right down the Facebook. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. for transformative technology community. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so Dr. Shrinshiri, I look forward to reading more about the whole person work that you are delving into and seeing what other references you have there. Please share any feedback in the Facebook as well, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want to see more of, less of. If you liked me sharing slides and then asking questions, or if you want people just to have a discussion in this group, um, I'd love to get your feedback. Um, and once I hear back, we'll also send out the next date. We'll, we'll, we'll be a month from now. And, um, and that's it for today. So thanks again, everybody. Wishing you a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Bye.